Good morning and welcome. My name is Dr. Shomani. I am a registrar in the Department of ENT at the University of Cape Town. I will be presenting this morning on failed extubation. I have no disclaimers and the patient's confidentiality was not violated during this talk. The definition of failed extubation is the inability to maintain spontaneous breathing after removal of an artificial airway, so an endotracheal tube or tracheostomy tube resulting in re-intubation within 72 hours. The two main scenarios in which failed extubation can occur. The first is failed extubation on the operating room table. So after an airway procedure that may have altered airway dynamics from the preoperative state. So for example, laser laryngoscopic surgery that re renders the airway edematous or um, non-airway surgery in an anatomically difficult neck. The second scenario is failed extubation in an ICU patient who has been intubated for organ support or, or neurological deficit and the like. So I will present a couple of scenarios to demonstrate um, my point. The first case was that of a 30-year-old male. This was an on-table consult and the patient had had a standard incision and drainage of Ludwig's angina by the maxillofacial surgeons and also had dental extraction. On extubation, the patient could not maintain his airway and he decompensated and arrested. CPR was done with return of spontaneous circulation after two minutes. Re-intubation was, was attempted with the CMAC, but this was difficult and unsuccessful. The airway was noted to be a dermatist, leading to use of an LMA. This allowed sufficient oxygenation and ventilation, during which time an ENT consult was sought. Note, in the initial intubation before the surgery occurred, um, the intubation was uneventful. Um, there was success after one trial with the aid of a CMAC, and a size 8 endotracheal tube was sighted. It was a confirmed in position and the tube was secured. So this was a picture of the patient when the ENT surgeon came to theater. He noted that the patient was obese. He had a short, fat neck and um, the pathological condition rendered his airway even more difficult. So the submental and submandibular edema made his neck even shorter. And intraorally, there was pus and bleeding from the procedure that had recently been done. So all in all, this was a difficult the Management of the patient was a group discussion between the anesthetist, the maxillofacial surgeon, and the ENT. And the plan was to maintain the airway with an LMA and proceed with a tracheostomy. The surgeon made a note of how difficult the tracheostomy was, but was successful extended length tracheostomy tube was used. And this was the final result and that just shows um, the wound traced on the final result. So um, a couple of questions that I have after uh, going through this case um, that we could ask ourselves was, was this a predictable sequence of events? Um, the second question is why was the extubation unsuccessful? So as we speak, this patient is actually alive. And so if the patient is alive, the team must have done something right. So what did the team do right that evening? And then the fourth question is, could they have improved upon anything? So to help answer these questions, we're going to look at the National Audit Project. So this is actually the largest study of major airway complications of airway management ever performed. They collected data between September 2008 and August 2009. So they captured detailed reports of major complications of airway management in the UK from all NHS hospitals. So England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. And the complications that they were interested in were serious complications. So death, brain damage, emergency surgical airway, and then admission to ICU or a prolonged ICU stay if the patient was already in ICU. 
So a lot of important conclusions were drawn from this doc document and uh, they were summarized in what they termed the executive summary. And the main um, findings that are relevant to this talk were that 38 of the 133 reports, which is 28%, were incidents that occurred during extubation and in the recovery room. In all reported cases, airway obstruction was the root cause of the complication. And in 50% of these cases, they noted that there was a delay in recognizing the problem. Two of these patients died, one sustained brain damage, 10 required emergency surgical airways, and the remainder were admitted to ICU. So there were other important conclusions that they drew from um, the, the document. Um, so the first was that anesthesia of the head and neck, uh, of any head and neck surgery, um, is a risk factor for these important or major head and neck complications. So poor airway assessment contributed to poor airway outcomes. And this was due to either complete omission of um, a proper assessment or incomplete assessment. So whether clinicians failed to predict a potentially difficult airway. And also failure to alter the management, the airway management technique in response to uh, the findings at the assessment. Another conclusion that they, that they came to was that poor planning was a common feature in these um, events. So there was lack of a coordinated logical sequence of plans, which I call plan A. But in some instances, although plan A was present, um, there was a lack of a plan B. So in instances where um, adverse events happened that altered the initial plan, there wasn't a second plan in place. And then problems arose when difficult intubation was managed by multiple repeat intubations, um, attempted intubations. And this quickly led to the, I can't intubate, can't ventilate situation. And so um, another conclusion was that management of an obstructed airway required particular skill and cooperation between the anesthetist and the surgeon. And this is best performed um, in a fully equipped environment with full surgical anesthetic and nursing support. And an operating room obviously is the ideal location. So it's actually a very nice document and they came up with a lot of um, important um, conclusions and summaries from it. It's a large document, but these are the main ones that I felt were um, relevant to the talk. So now the Difficult um, Airway Society also, which is a, a UK-based society of airway specialists, so 3,500 to be precise. This is the society that was established in 1996, and they meet every year to discuss all things about the airway. So uh, they came up with extubation guidelines, and basically they stratify patients as high risk and low risk. So um, this would be like a tip, uh, their typical algorithm where they've got four steps um, that lead up to the patient being taken to recovery and being transported safely back. So I'll show you the, the algorithm for the at-risk patient. So like our patient and the... And a, a at-risk at extubation is one where the ability to oxygenate is uncertain and reintubation is potentially difficult right such as our patient and the key the key question really in is can this patient be safely extubated or can we remove the tube and there are many considerations um, as you can see on step two at the end so if you feel you can extubate the patient then you proceed or you can um, use advanced techniques like your airway exchange catheter and all the other things listed there. If you feel that the patient cannot be extubated for anesthetic and surgical reasons, then you can either postpone the extubation and transfer the patient to um, um, HDU or ICU or proceed with the tracheostomy. So I think the considerations from this are we always have to stratify um, our patients. So a patient like ours who was obese with a short neck who's got a, um, a condition that renders his airway um, impossible to re-intubate, you need to stop and think and plan as a group. And then the patient who's got an ideal long thin neck, who's having a procedure that doesn't necessarily um, 
compromise their airway, you can proceed. Um, you can proceed safely. So the other issue or the other consideration is that um, before the anesthesia begins, we must always have a clear plan um, of what to do. So the whole team needs to be um, on board. So all expertise must be present before uh, the patient is put to sleep. Um, so, so a clear sequence of events, everyone who needs to be there must be there before the procedure starts. All the equipment that may be needed, you can't start looking for um, equipment uh, during the procedure. You must consent for a tracheostomy if you are concerned. And then you must also organize an ICU bed if you feel um, it's necessary. So if I go back to my first questions is, was this a predictable sequence of events? Uh, my answer to that is yes. This patient was obese, he had a short fat neck, he had Ludwig's angina, which we know renders the airway difficult or even impossible to re-intubate. So why was the extubation unsuccessful? So for the reasons I've already stated, I do think though that the initial relative ease of intubation was misleading and uh, gave a false sense of confidence and encouraged um, extubation where the patient maybe shouldn't have been extubated. Um, what did the team do right? What did the on-call team do right? Um, I think they did a lot of um, correct things. They recognized early that the patient was in danger. They were able to call for help while actively resuscitating the patient and achieved a return of spontaneous circulation. Um, importantly, they did not try multiple times to intubate when they failed, and rather they had um, they used the LMA. And then also there was a group discussion um, after the patient was stable enough, and um, you know the, the surgeon, the Maxvax, the, the ENT, and the anesthetist then uh, forged a plan in the patient's best interest. And uh, do I think they could have improved upon anything? Well, we all can improve. I think they could have left the patient intubated and sent to ICU to allow for the edema to settle. But we know that ICU space is not always available, especially during COVID. So uh, that's a major consideration. Um, they could perhaps have had considered a staged extubation. Um, if um, Dr. Hoffman, if Prof. Hoffman is around, perhaps you could uh, help explain that to us. And then the other thing they could have done was perhaps to consider a tracheostomy quite early on, uh, knowing that the patient's airway um, was compromised. Um, Harriet, I don't know if I can ask um, for any comments because I know um, Prof. Hoffman has to leave. I'm not too sure if he's on the call, but. Um, Perhaps I could ask him to comment if he is um, on the call. If uh, Prof. Hoffman is on the call, uh, would he like to comment? Um, briefly, I haven't seen Prof. Hoffman sure. on the okay. call. Okay, uh, sure. I'll, okay, so I'll, I'll proceed. So my second scenario for failed um, extubation, um, again, I'll present a case. So a 10 month old boy uh, that we were called to see in the pediatric ICU at Red Cross. So he was day four post repair of a tetralogy of the law. And we were consulted because he had had two failed attempts of extubation. Before surgery, there was no difficulty breathing. He had been feeding well. There were no apneic episodes. Um, and he had had one cyanotic episode, which uh, we thought was related to his cardiac lesion. His background history was that he was a term delivery and um, he was delivered via cesarean section for fetal distress. He required supplemental oxygen at birth, but was never um, intubated. So the past surgical history, so as, as I've said, he had his surgery four days prior to us being um, consulted. It was uneventful surgery. The intubation was also uneventful. He was sent to ICU while intubated and um, a normal post-surgery echo um, was noted. The rest of the history was non-contributory. So when we examined him at the bedside, we noted that he had been intubated with the size 3.5 endotracheal tube that was uncapped. He was on low ventilator setting. So he had an FIO2 of 30 and a PEEP of 5. He was non-syndromic, so he had a normal jaw, normal tongue, and the like. The oral cavity and oral pharynx 
um, the neck and the chest were essentially normal. So we took the patient um, to theater for a direct laryngotracheal bronchoscopy. And um, we found, so it was just, so this is a picture similar to what we found. Um, so there was some glottic edema and um, they were intubation granulomas that were present about mid third of the vocal cords bilaterally. And then in the subglottis, um, there was subglottic edema and there was also some anterior tracheal wall injury and there were lateral shelves um, immediately in the subglottis. So we went ahead and removed the granuloma, we excised the granuloma. Um, the subglottis was dilated with a size six nanoclus the balloon twice. And then post dilation, a size four endotracheal tube was easily advanced, but there was no leak at 20 centimeters of water. The patient was reintubated, um, sorry for the spelling error, with a size 3.5 endotracheal tube of which there was a leak. The patient was transferred back to ICU and our plan was to give him steroids for 24 hours in the extubate to CPAP. So indeed, the patient was extubated successfully to CPAP and then to high flow nasal oxygen and eventually to room A in 48 hours. And the patient was discharged to the general ward and did well. So what are some of the reasons why patients in ICU may fail extubation? And of those, which ones are the ones that concern us as ENTs? So, um, so different ICU units have different um, extubation failure rates. So um, the data I'm showing right now is from um, a teaching hospital in France. And what they showed was that um, the highest rate of failed extubation was in preterm um, patients, but the rate was comparable between adults and um, normal children. So um, there is such a thing as an optimum extubation failure rate, and it's quoted as being 10 to 15 percent. Um, it's optimum because a higher rate suggests that the patients are being extubated too early or not properly assessed for readiness, while a lower rate suggests that the extubation protocol is too strict. Um, however, reintubation is associated with longer ICU length of stay, higher rates of pneumonia, and death. So they, they are patients that are at risk of failing um, extubation. So older patients, patients with severe cardiac disease, patients with severe primary disease on ICU admission, um, a prolonged a dura duration of ventilation before extubation, and then use of continuous sedation, neurological impairment, which is an independent risk factor, and women. So, um, so this is a study that was, um, so it basically showed prospective data um, of different ICU units. And the first or the circled data um, is the number of patients from the different units that had frank upper airways obstruction. So the reason why they couldn't be extubated was um, glottic edema, granuloma and the like. And the rest of the patients from all the studies were um, from, failed extubation from medical causes. So by far, the, the, like in most ICU units, actually in all of them, um, the main reason why patients are not extubatable is for medical reasons, it's not a surgical uh, cause. So impaired clearance of secretions, respiratory failure, hypoxemia, hypercapnia, cardiac failure, neurological impairment. And actually, the number of patients that need ENT intervention from the study was 7.7%. Uh, and those are the ones that um, we will focus on. So when we get to the bedside um, at, uh, in ICU, we will ask for a cuff leak test or, um, well, we won't do it ourselves, but we will ask for one or ask about it, whether it was done. And it's basically done to predict the risk of post-extubation stridor in an intubated patient. And the absence of a leak test suggests that there is airway edema and increases the risk of post-extubation stridor. So it's not a perfect test. Sometimes it can be spuriously absent or negative, such as in a patient that's been inappropriately intubated with a, a large tube for whatever reason, a patient with excessive secretions around the tube, 
or patient was ventilated with low peak pressures. I won't go into too much detail about how it's done, um, but at the end of the day, we want to be able to observe a leak of more than 110 mils um, through the tube, through a deflated cup. And when we have that, um, this rules out laryngeal edema enough to warrant reintubation, enough to not warrant reintubation actually, with a negative predictive value of 98%. Um, um, other literature describes that they just listen for a leak, but obviously actually measuring how much air leaks is, um, is better or is superior. And so um, steroids have been shown to be useful in patients that fail the cuff leak test. And from uh, the study that I'm showing there, I'm, I'm sorry, it's an old study, but uh, they do recommend the use of steroids and have shown that there, there's a, a statistically significant reduction in failed extubations with steroid use. Right. So now when we are called in, um, our role really is to proceed with a direct laryngotracheal bronchoscopy. And um, the aim of our assessment is to, one, to make a diagnosis, um, to define the level of obstruction, and um, also to assess whether there's a synchronous um, lesion or synchronous pathology that might render it a multi-level obstruction. So there's different uh, findings that one can make during such an assessment. So you can find intubation granuloma, glottic edema, glottic stenosis, vocal cord paralysis, subglottic edema, subglottic stenosis, tracheal stenosis or tracheal, uh, tracheomalacia. And um, most of these are amenable to endoscopic intervention. So I'll, I'll speak briefly on vocal cord paralysis post intubation. So um, intubation related vocal cord paralysis is a rare event. It has been observed in uh, patients with multiple intubation attempts or traumatic intubation, but it may also occur in uh, patients that were intubated without any history of um, a difficult intubation. The incidence is 0.03%, but overall they account for 22.6% of all causes of vocal cord paralysis. It's usually unilateral, but can be bilateral. And it's thought to occur from compression of the anterior branch of recurrent laryngeal nerve between the inflated cuff and the endotracheal, um, sorry, the inflated cuff of the tube and the thyroid cartilage. So Cavo and his colleagues performed a series of laryngeal di uh, dissections, which showed that um, the, the, he pinpointed the site where he thought the recurrent laryngeal nerve was um, affected. And he pinpointed this to six to 10 millimeters below the posterior third of the true vocal cords. Um, vocal cord or rather immobile cords may be the result of um, arytenoid dislocation, which would then be a fixation rather than a paralysis. So um, this is um, a scope of a patient that we took to theater a few days ago at the children's hospital. It's a six month old who um, was post repair of coarctation of the aorta and failed extubation. And so we did note um, unilateral vocal cord um, paralysis. Um, sorry, let me go back. To, okay, sorry. Okay. Um, okay, I wanted to play this. So that six week old um, patient had, uh, just give me a minute, I'm just trying to. Okay, so he had synchronous pathology and this is the actual scope and it demonstrates that the patient had tracheomalacia. Um, that's the camera going in and you'll notice the posterior wall of the trachea collapse. Um, on, on, on ventilation of the patient. Give it a moment. Okay, there we go. Okay, so, okay. So the management of um, vocal cord paralysis post-intubation really starts with preventative measures 
measures. So appropriate tube size, appropriate cuff pressure, and atraumatic um, intubation, securing the tube at least 15 millimeters below um, the true cords, but obviously not too deep such that we're ventilating one lung. And then the management generally depends on whether it's unilateral or bilateral. Recovery can occur up to a year after the injury. So with unilateral vocal cord palsy, in the absence of another lesion in the airway, the patient should be extubatable. And um, we need to optimize the airway med medically with PPIs and um, intravenous steroids. And then long-term management. Um, so generally, we wouldn't do anything for um, less than a year, within a year of the injury, because it may resolve. But um, the long-term or definitive management um, involves the medialization procedures really to improve the quality of the voice. So injection thyroplasty, medialization thyroplasty, arytenoid adduction, and arytenoid opexy, or our um, re-innovation procedures. With bilateral vocal cord palsy, we are unlikely to be able to extubate the patient. And so the primary aim in this management is to be able to secure the airway. And this is done usually via um, a tracheostomy. This will allow the patient to uh, leave ICU and be managed in a general ward and actually eventually be discharged home with tracheostomy care. And definitive management would be, um, again, to create an airway and decannulate the patient. Um, and so these would be our lateralization procedures, um, arytenoidectomy or cordotomy, re-innovation techniques, use of botulinum toxin, um, injection in the vocal folds adductors. Okay, so um, the last thing I'll talk about is intubation granuloma. So intubation granuloma are part of a spectrum of changes in the larynx following inflammation related to intubation. And um, laryngeal edema begins, it's been shown that it only takes a few hours for laryngeal um, damage to occur following intubation. And it occurs because the microcirculation um, of the mucosa and the perichondrium is interrupted uh, when an ETT is placed with high pressures, particularly with high pressures. Um, and so it's actually more the size of the tube rather than the cuff pressures in this instance. And so once the, 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 the pressure that the tube exerts on the, on the mucosa exceeds the capillary, uh, pressure, then we get um, inflammation, edema, necrosis, and the like. It's actually been uh, referred to in some texts as a bed sore of the larynx. So the, the illustrated image shows uh, how a tube sits inside you in a patient that's intubated. And because the patient is supine, the tube will rest on the um, inferior leaf when the patient is in, in, in the supine position. And so the vulnerable areas um, that are likely to develop granulomas or any sort of injury really are the medial surfaces of the arytenoids, the vocal processes, the cricoarytenoid joints, the cricoid cartilage, the posterior glottic and interarytenoid region. And so um, this diagram is not a nice one, but um, what it shows is the different uh, changes that can occur at the level of the glottis following um, intubation. So you can get um, subglottic stenosis, which is the arrow that's going to the left, or otherwise you can get the annular ulceration, and then you get the granulation, which can proceed to granulation tissue and um, stenosis, so posterior glottic stenosis. Okay, so um, it can appear, so the, the appearance is variable. So in this image, um, we're seeing a well circumscribed um, pedunculated lesion adjacent to the endotracheal tube. And then this is the image I showed earlier is um, granulation tissue that's uh, molded around the tube. And so the management really of gran intubation granulomas is um, we follow the principles of microphonal surgery is um, although in this instance, we're not trying to improve the quality of the voice, but we are trying to um, extubate the patient, create an airway so the patient is extubatable. And so we want to reset uh, the granuloma via an atraumatic technique. We never want to reset and give two raw edges that, will, um, that are likely to form adhesions or web. 
And if we have any raw surfaces, then we want to cover them with mucosa if we um, can. And so my take home message is intraoperatively, failed extubation can be catastrophic. And the airway quickly becomes a shared airway between the anesthetist and the surgeon. In ICU, the majority of cases are from non-surgical causes. And those related to obstruction are usually amenable to endoscopic intervention. Um, that's it. And those are my references. Brooksle, thanks very much for a comprehensive presentation. Um, I would immediately like to ask Dr. Jenna Piercy, an intensivist at um, Grotesquier Hospital and UCT, um, to please um, comment. Um, uh, maybe Dr. Piercy, if you could comment on uh, the rates of belt extubation um, you, know, you see here at um, in the ICUs of um, Grotesquier, um, especially taking into um, re regard COVID. And I would also like to ask um, what length of uh, intubation is regarded as prolonged intubation and um, what goes on in the decision making process to involve ENT in doing a, um, a, a tracheostomy or um, prolonged intubation. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Kurt. Can you hear me okay? I've got my earphones on. Okay. So firstly, I'd just yes, like to thank... Thanks, Butle. I'd just like to thank you for a really excellent presentation. I thought it was fantastic. And I don't really have a huge amount of, of extra information to add from our side. I'd just like a disclaimer that my practice doesn't in any way involve pediatric patients. So yes. to talk on the recommendations for peds is way out of my comfort zone. Um, in, in terms of our failed extubation rates in the ICU, I don't have that information at the moment. Um, I know that when Professor Mitchell looked at it a few years ago in the surgical ICU, it was in keeping with the recommendations between 10 to 15%. As you mentioned, the recommendations are that you should expect to have um, a, a certain percentage of, of failed extubations because otherwise you're just being too um, reticent and um, timid in your extubations, which prolongs your time on mechanical ventilation and then obviously leads to increase in morbidity and mortality. Um, so I don't, unfortunately I don't have our figures, but I know they were, when Professor Mitchell looked a few years ago, they were in keeping with, with the international recommendations. So that's a good thing for us. When it comes to looking at prolonged or um, what, what, what we call prolonged intubation, then it seems that most of the indications say that when you've been intubated for about six days, that's when you start to increase and have an increase in the number of, in the a greater risk of post extubation stridor and complications. But hard and fast rules, so if you look at the literature, and I'm sure Bushley knows this better than me, um, if you look at when to intubate patients in ICU or some trials, some trials will, will say late extubation late tracheostomies and call it anything from above 10 days and other studies will call late tracheostomies anything above three weeks. So it's very variable um, from, from center to center, although we do recognize that patients who've been um, had a, 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 a an endotracheal tube, a translaryngeal tube in situ for more than six days are at increased risk of post-extubation stridal. Um, in terms of what we do, um, in the COVID era, obviously, um, if we have a, so, so we, do ex, we do evaluate our patients, particularly with the COVID patients, they tend to have longer periods of translaryngeal intubation. So we do perform cuff leak tests in our patients. And occasionally, if we're very concerned, then we actually give them some propofol and do some direct laryngoscopy or indirect laryngoscopy with a, um, with a laryngoscope, just ourselves in the unit. Um, Obviously, um, theatre time is a premium with the COVID patients because they're fully anticoagulated. Not all of them can be done in the ICU. So, as you know, as well, those of you who work at UCT know that in the ICUs, we do an awful lot of our own percutaneous tracheostomies by the intensivists in the ICU. But obviously, um, as that beautiful diagram you illustrated earlier, we're not going to choose somebody with a really difficult um, airway and a short fat neck and Ludwig's angina. So we are limited because of our expertise and also the equipment available. So we don't, we don't do tracheostomies in anybody who's fully anticoagulated 
in the ICU by the intensivist. Obviously, um, in the COVID era, because our patients are on therapeutic um, anticoagulation, then a lot of the trackies are being done either in theatre or in the ICU with a theatre team and an ENT specialist. But nevertheless, we do try to assess our patients in terms of um, post-extubation stridor, and we try we, we give them the proper spontaneous breathing trial, and we assess the patients for muscle strength, ability to cough, clearing secretions, and so on and so forth, all the usual things. But by the time the patient failed extubation twice, um, then we, if, if, if we haven't been able to get a, a tracheostomy, then they're the kind of patients, if you failed extubation twice, then they're the ones who we would really like a tracheostomy before we proceed to to try a third time because we've kind of learned your lesson if you've tried to optimize the patient from, from all other aspects. Herit, I hope that answers all your points. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Piercy. Um, that's excellent input. Um, I don't see any questions on the chat function. Um, Prof, would you like to comment on um, the talk and on, on the comments? Yeah, firstly, I'd like to echo uh, what Jenna said. I thought it was a, an outstanding presentation. And, um, and just to tell Jenna that the, these presentations do go onto the YouTube sort of channel, so you might want to share it with your anesthetic registrars. Uh, but I really thought it was an excellent um, presentation. And just to say, it, the patients where the red flags go up for me are obviously um, anatomical factors, you know, like a small mandible, um, a poor malampathy score, um, and um, a, a patient with a fixed cervical spine, you know, one has to always be concerned about those patients with trismus preoperatively. And then also other cases where we really get worried are tumors, tumors of the base of tongue, you know, where that can be difficult to intubate. Um, also be concerned about the patient with the large, large uh, um, supergonic tumor, because that's a, that, that almost becomes a, a sort of dynamic um, obstruction, because when the patient relaxes, then all those tissues just fall in. Um, so this can be a problem. The previous chemo radiation, I've had, uh, I've had a few hairy, hairy moments in my career where you have a patient with a really hard, stiff neck, you know, where, where when you're trying to intubate the patient, absolutely nothing moves. And, um, and the patients, obviously, you have a big flap in the mouth, you have to be concerned about that. But I think what's really important is that the ENT surgeon should always be standing by at the time of extubation of any patient who's, uh, who's had, had um, 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 had, had any form of surgery in the oral cavity or the pharynx because, you, you know, because often, often time is of the essence and, and, and you should really be standing at the bedside while the patient is being extubated. Um, I'd just like to ask, ask Jenna, you know, we rely very much on, uh, you know, on monitoring the patient's oxygen levels um, in, in recovery when it comes to, come to, come to determining a patient who might, might get airway obstruction. Uh, but my understanding is that that's actually quite a late feature. And, uh, you know, they're going to become hypercapnic before they become, then they become hyper, hyper, um, uh, 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 you know, yeah, before the oxygen level is going to, going to drop. And have you got some, some comment on that and, and how best to, best to monitor these patients when you're concerned about airway obstruction? Sure, look, um, yeah, and it's something that we were taught back in the, in the days when I was an anaesthetist. Um, Professor James was very um, against the, um, the supplemental oxygen in the recovery room for that very reason, because you can have a patient who's getting supplemental face mask oxygen and still hypoventilating. So as you mentioned, their SATs may stay up, but that's their PaCO2 that's going to rise. Um, it's difficult in terms of what you're going to have to look for um, for the patients who are going to run into trouble. Obviously, it's nice to see if you can get a patient to cope off face mask oxygen before you discharge them from the recovery room, but that's not always practical. Um, and then clearly just looking at the patients for signs of, of, of um, respiratory distress, be it a hypo um, ventilation or very, very tachypneic patients, which are usually it's a tachypneic struggling patients who are obvious where it's those patients who are breathing shallowly and quietly and hypoventilating that the ones are going to run it probably into trouble and, and may dip under the radar. But in terms of monitoring, just clinically, I think you have to look at for patients with sympathetic stimulation that may occur due to the high CO2s, dilated pupils, diaphoresis, um, and so on and so forth. But um, I think it's just not relying just on the patient's oxygenation and saturation. You just have to you know, look at the patients holistically um, um, rather than just looking at SATs, for example. 
Okay. And if I can just add, I think, uh, I think the old maxim holds that, that if you've got a patient where you think they might get into trouble, it's always safer to do tracheostomy. Yeah. You know, don't, uh, um, and, and if you're going to try and, try and, try and, try and so decannulate a patient with a tracheostomy in the ward, uh, um, do it in the morning. When the staff are around, then don't do it over weekends, you know, because you really want to have, want to have staff on, on the premises um, should they get into, get into any trouble. Um, is, um, is Shazia on the call? Prof, she said she would be in theatre and she would try to uh, join in. I'm not too sure if she is logged on. So you hear it, I'll, I'll hand over to you again. Okay. Um, we have two comments on the uh, chat function. Um, the first one is from um, Dr. Asker Parieker. He's just asking if the patient had underlying OSA preceding the infection, which is um, highly possible um, taking into account his uh, BMI and, um, and uh, anatomy. And he just says this would have worsened the acutely compromised airway. And um, he says in his practice, he's found that a nasopharyngeal kip tube helps in post-op um, phase in, uh, in OSA patients. And then um, from Barnele, she says a very good presentation, thank you. And um, if Shazia was around, she could answer how, uh, um, Barnele asks, how do you manage pediatric patients with persistent glottic or supraglottic edema who fail extubation? And on, um, MLB, there's just the your edema. Maybe, Bukhle, if you, um, from uh, your reading script, answer. So what I do know is um, at Red Cross, rarely will they extubate a child um, on the table and send them to ICU. They would, so it's a, it's a, it's a phased extubation. So they will get the steroids and the adrenaline nibs and all of that. But in addition, you will extubate them to CPAP um, in ICU in a controlled sort of environment. And then if they cope on CPAP, then they would go to um, um, high flow nasal oxygen and then um, so on and so forth, such that the CPAP as well, something that we have discussed is it's, it's, a, it's a non-invasive ventilation. So you can't really say you've extubated if the patient can't get off CPAP, but it's not, it's, it's not intubation proper. So from what I've seen um, us do at Red Cross, that's how we do it in ICU. And once they're completely off oxygen, then we'll say we've successfully extubated. So it will happen over a couple of days. I see there's no more questions on the chat function. Um, is there anyone who would like to ask a question? Um, maybe I'm just going to hand over to Simon. Hi, Bukhle. Thanks very much for the lovely presentation. I just wanted to ask the group uh, uh, what Dr. Pearcey alluded to about, about an early tracheostomy on day six versus late tracheostomies. Uh, of, of, of any definition, either um, two weeks or three weeks. Is there any difference in, in sort of outcome of, of using either protocol um, in terms of success of the protocol? Um, obviously, and in, in the non-COVID era in anticipation of hopefully getting over the COVID eventually. So for example, if you've got a patient on day six and you, you wanna try and go beyond the, the early tracheostomy um, and, and aim for a late tracheostomy, does that r r result in a, in a difference in, in outcome and success of the protocol? Simon, can I answer? That's directed at you, yeah. Oh, it is, sorry, it was directed to me, sorry. Simon, no, there's no difference. It all very much depends on um, institutional preference, but more importantly, your patient's own profile. Um, there are many patients that we don't intubate um, early, for example, they may be on a higher FiO2 and you may not deem it um, safe to, to tracheostomize a patient who's on a high FiO2. Similarly, there are some patients that we will tracheostomize very early. For example, a patient with severe Guillain Barre, um, we may tracky them on day two or day three or four if they've already had um, IVIG in the ward and haven't been um, improving on that. So it very much depends on your patient and their pathology um, as well as their characteristics like the, the, the FiO2 and the PaO2. 
Um, but we don't have hard and fast rules in our ICUs to when we would intubate and ventilate, uh, I beg your pardon, when we would tracheostomize a patient. Um, I think it, it's very much not only dependent on the patient, but also theater time. As you know, we've, we've had problems um, getting patients to theater, but even those that we do do in the ICU, we'll sometimes wait and push on a little bit because we think the patient's looking like they're going to improve. And often we don't track your patients until two weeks, at least two weeks. And there's no difference in long-term outcome in patients, whether they get early or late tracheostomies. Thank you very much. I see there's no more questions on the chat function. Um, that concludes our session for today. Buchle, thank you very much for um, this multidisciplinary and comprehensive presentation. And sincere thanks to Dr. Piercy for joining our meeting and for the comments and to Prof. Bagan as well. Um, thanks everyone. And just a, a reminder of our um, case presentations um, this coming Friday. Um, it's at um, 8.30 um, and the link will be sent out. Thanks everyone.